that is a really weird way to sort of think about, um, you know, a lot of other things. Like, lobster economy, like the economy of lobsters is a total fabrication as well. Um, you know, as a luxury item, there are characteristics of that economically that don't exist in any other kind of, um, uh, that don't exist in any other system uh, of luxury items or barely. Um, so this was, a, oh, no, 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 shh, shh, no, no, all right. So this is kind of a little video that I made where I just sort of wanted to really stare at the lobster like crazy. Um, and I guess it's gonna work, or maybe it's not gonna work, I'm not sure. And one thing I found about lobsters is that talking about them is really personal and people will often tell you the most intimate details of their life kind of straight out of the gates. Um, I had a woman actually tell me that she was adopted within minutes of meeting me after, you know, explaining that her adopted father was a lobster man who had once fished a lobster that was about eight feet long, you know. Um, and they also raise a bunch of other issues. Uh, some of the, one of the issues that I'm also interested in is the idea of pain and empathy, which, you know, to some extent is like what we look at when we look at subjects. It's like, do we have an empathy for these, you know, for these subjects? Are they just subjects? And so, uh, you know, um, David Foster Wallace wrote Consider the Lobsters, an essay initially written for a gourmet magazine. Um, where Gourmet Magazine sent him to Rockland's Lobster Fest, and he essentially was like, eh, this is a state fair, this is, this is kind of weird, so I'm gonna write about whether lobsters feel pain. And uh, biologically, like a lobster's uh, nervous system is like this string of lights that goes up the, is like goes up their body, and it's like, uh, they're just nerve endings going on. So they don't actually have, they have a nervous system that's sort of more akin to that of a grasshopper. Um, is that it's just sort of like a branch with sticks off of it rather than like a brain, you know. Um, and so essentially they, they're like this linear being, which if you think about it, it's like they have this linear nervous system, which is also sort of like this lengthy, like long time span as well. They don't actually have like a bulbous end, and um, there's not like an end of their evolution, it's just like this uh, So basically, David Foster Wallace ended up being more concerned about whether or not they feel pain and how we relate to feeling pain, and you know, one of his, one of his famous quotes in, the, in that article was, um, let's see, uh, basically try to imagine, okay, so uh, the thing that happens at, Rock, at Rockland's Lobster Fest is that the lobsters are killed like four people while they, you know, and that's also a thing that happens in a lot of other coastal towns is that you'll go to like a restaurant and there'll be like a bake outside and they just have this steam thing and you pick out your lobster and then they kill it for you right there. Um, and so David Foster Wallace says, try to imagine a Nebraska beef festival in which part of the festivities is watching trucks pull up and the live cattle get driven down the ramp and slaughtered right there on the world's largest killing floor or something. There's no way, like that wouldn't happen. So he was really fascinated in the idea of like how do we relate to something um, that we that we kill, you know. Um, uh, and actually, pragmatically, if you actually do want to talk about ways in which you can reduce a lobster's struggle when you put it in a pot of water, is freeze it. We found out that like if you freeze it for about 30 seconds, um, it reduces the amount of time that it struggles. And really, the thing is like what we're thinking, what we're talking about, is that there's no actual way to figure out if lobsters feel pain. Some people think that. I mean, lobsters do communicate with sound. They are capable of using sound to communicate. Um, so there are some people who think that, you know, when you put a lobster in boiling water, that squeal that happens is escaping air. Some people think it actually is a lobster screaming. I guess you can sort of think about whatever you want. There is a lot of air in the shell. Um, but the main thing, I think, is that just because they don't necessarily feel pain the way we feel pain doesn't mean that they don't have a response. If you have a nervous system, you have a response. Um, and I guess maybe the point is like, does that response even matter? I mean, we're sort of eating something 
it's like, it, does it feel pain? Does it matter that we know that it feels pain? Or is it the fact that like this living thing that's like 300 million years old is something that you can get in a grocery store? And it's also the only thing that is alive that you can get in a grocery store. Um, so uh, some of the other things about lobsters that I think, well, OK, OK, uh, as, a, as an aside, um, David Foster <coughs> Wallace killed himself. And there, uh, I was just reading um, in De Losing Guitar, there's a section about becoming and being animal, and the idea of the becoming and being the shadow. Um, like your own, you know, your shadow is like that which you can't recognize. And in a way, it sort of is your double. And um, philosophically, the idea of a lobster is sort of, uh, the losing guitar talk about it as that God is a lost or God is a double bind. It's this thing which is its own um, reflection and its own its own system of layering. You can have a single organism with a with a double layering structure, and um, so David Foster Wallace killed himself, and then this is and then forty years previous to that, the losing guitar wrote about how. Um, an over, you know, identification and becoming, like a becomings, um, is often uh, is often a characteristic of writer suicides, which I don't even really know. Basically, uh, I sort of don't, I don't really quite know how to process that. Now, um, I I do eat lobster, <laughs> you know, um, and. I think they're really amazing, uh, and I wonder how much time I have left. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. So be selfish. Be <laughs> selfish about this. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, 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 he threw himself out a window. Yeah, he was yes. also like paralyzed and dying. <laughs> yeah. Was, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. well, so, I guess it's just, uh, uh, so we'll talk a little, I'm going to talk a little bit about luxury and how lobsters became a luxury item. Um, so, I already talked a little bit about how they um, were so plentiful that any lobster under four pounds is essentially thrown back. And um, uh, they, what basically what happened was that they, uh, it was sort of a slow, it was a slow build. Um, I guess at first, the first colonists were here, um, people were embarrassed about having the only thing to serve them was lobster, you know? Um, and so uh, it was actually, uh, one thing I read is that it was the rise of the railroad in America that helped establish lobsters specifically as a luxury item. I'm still a little bit confused because a lot of still lights from the 1500s and 1600s still have a large table filled with game. And, you know, uh, one of those pieces of game will be a steamed or boiled red lo you know, a red lobster in this image. And so, you know, I mean, the, the let's see, the railroad was like the 1800s. Um, those paintings are from the 50 or 60, 1500s or 1600s. So this sort of railroad idea doesn't quite even out, and I'm also interested and sort of curious about precisely how the North American lobster made it on a red table, like red on a table in like some in like some place in Holland in like the 1500s or whatever, and how it was part of this culture of game um, and and plenty, the idea of, of of the luxury of plenty, because at that point. Anything that was like a bounty, the representation of a bounty, would have been a type of luxury. Um, so, uh, oh, hello, you're done. Um, so, so uh, in the railroads, basically, I think what happened was uh, they were, they needed something that could. Uh, they, someone made like lobster salad, and uh, people were served lobster salad. I'm just gonna let that be all weird looking right now. Um, and that was how lobster sort of became like a unique thing. You know, people in the middle of the country didn't really have any, they had no exposure to lobster. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, they could take the train, which was exotic, and they could have lobster, which was also exotic. Um, so, 
they sort of became their own luxury item in the sense that like there weren't a whole lot like there are very few things that we can think of agriculturally that sort of dictate their own um, economic structure but like right now for instance lobsters are more plentiful than they have been in like decades um, initially you know supply um, dictated the cost and also you have things like shipping and the, you know picking them and canning them or whatever but with a live lobster um, they they I think it was like in the around the end of the 19th century that they figured out how to store lobsters um, in order to ship them live and um, in addition to you know having people eat the canned meat and then <clears throat> I think uh, if you think about like the, the move up to the 50s and the idea of luxury eating things like steak and lobster being sort of the same thing like lobsters um, are now more so they're more plentiful than ever which means that at the dock lobster fishermen are basically getting like two dollars a pound for and they're out there they're all day like a lobster day is like 12 hours and like pulling traps um, you know the traps sit overnight you pull the trap um, you take the lobsters out, you measure them, and then you bake them, and you have to do it really quickly. So there's one, someone driving the boat, and then there's someone pulling the trap up. And that action of taking the lobsters out, stuffing it in a bake bag, and throwing the trap back in has to happen in basically like under a minute, you know, because most people who operate commercial lobster traps will operate up to like 700, if not, you know, if not more. And uh, lobster, like, you know, land lines, like the lines of your traps are also, uh, they're passed down through families. It's, you know, it's the it's America's oldest fishery. So anyway, so right now what happens, what's happening is that lobster fishermen are pulling more lobsters than ever and they're getting paid less at the dock. So that means like $2, you know. But if you go to the grocery store, I only recently noticed that the cost of lobsters had gone down. It's been $15 a pound. And then only recently it went down to like twelve for like two dollar lobsters. I mean, if you go to Hunter Room, you know, if you go to H Mart, they're like six or seven dollars a pound. Um, but that's the thing is that, and the other thing is that they will not, you know, could we? Okay, one of the questions is, could we tolerate cheaper lobsters? Like, if lobsters became cheaper to us, would we have this idea that they actually were? cheaper and would there be like would that bracket for restaurants and you know like luxury food stuff would that not you know like would we not have this kind of luxury thing that's special to us um the thing is that they sort of are their own economy that's governed both by our whims about what we want to be rich and also things like restaurants which they want something that has a really high price point so that you know when they're selling something like salmon the salmon can be just less expensive than lobster, but still expensive enough that they can make their money back. And it's just this really odd, there are a lot of odd psychological factors. It's not like when you have a lot of strawberries, you sell the strawberries really cheap because you want to get rid of them, you know. Um, it's like, it's a very controlled thing, but only at one end. Um, and so they also think because the oceans are getting warmer is a reason that we're having, we have more lobsters. So then you have this thing like, what if we have no choice? And I mean, you can just basically put a trap in the ground. You know, the idea is back when they were really plentiful and they weren't being fished as a luxury item, you could just like, just find them. You could just go out in like your little wooden boat, which is what they did, is they went out in like these little wooden canoes and they had wooden traps and then they would like just get lobsters, you know, and uh, just they were like, they were so plentiful. It was like this buffalo kind of, you know, and now buffalo are coming back. Lobsters essentially never went away. And what if lobsters, lobsters sort of are like this weird buffalo of the ocean, but <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that like, uh, there is a chance that they will become so plentiful again that, you know, uh, what if they return back to their status as something that's, that's low? Um, I guess what I'm kind of getting at is that they are, they're essentially like a contradictory organism. Um, and they are, they're pretty unique in that sense. This is a, this is a, just a little fun aside. This is the moon card in the tarot. This is the Rider Waite deck. Here's the moon card. Now the moon is essentially, we're gonna make a huge jump here back into the realm of the psychological. Um, 
this is sort of your internal. This is your internal. And this is also interesting that lobsters themselves represent um, in in the esoteric, they, re they represent philosophically and esoteric, something that is like the unknowable, you know. I mean, luxury items are driven by our psychological desires as, commuter, as co commuters, as, uh, consumers. <laughs> <laughs> as consumers. So this is essentially like this journey, your journey of the moon, you know, like you're this crayfish, you know, uh, and these dogs and these towers are a conflict to your inner journey, you know. Uh, this car is governed by Pisces, water is, um, you know, it's, it's water signs are a sign that's ruled by the unconscious. So I guess it's kind of interesting that they have this, they, they, they sort of are a level of the unconscious um, that makes you, it sort of makes you wonder about the nature of pain and the nature of like looking at something and uh, wondering how much like, how much we do put on the things that we consume, and how much we how much we put on the things that we look at. Um, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, does Europe and uh, Asia have equivalent species? There, uh, the American lobster is the only lobster that has like claws. Mm -hmm. There, are, there's like dozens of different kinds. Like there are Caribbean, where warm water lobsters that have they they all have ten legs. Um, and you know, like Caribbean species, warmer water species, and some European species will just be pretty much like the tails. Um, I'm specific. I specifically look at the the uh, at Omaris americanus, the North American lobster, because of how often it appears, and also it can be sort of this weird parallel to things like crayfish, crabs, and such. But if you see like the lobsters that have like the black and white spots, that's also a really common thing. That's like sort of like a Caribbean. And more and more lobster. And a, and a follow up. In your research, did you find out what the oldest uh, lobster in captivity was? Mm. Um, the museum, the Delaware Museum of Natural History, has a specimen. I, th I forget what it's called, but they have a specimen that I think is like 35 or 37 pounds. Um, and it was actually involved in uh, this artist, Rosemary Trockel, had an exhibition in the museum in which she uh, she had her own works on display, these like kind of like curiosity cabinet things that she had made. And one of the things that she and she pulled in a lot of work from other artists and one of the thing and like other museums and one of the things that she pulled in was this um, uh, they basically kept his shell. It was like a taxidermy lobster, which is funny because like a taxidermy lobster is just the shell of the lobster. Um, but it's like the shell of this lobster and it's like this it's that big. So you think like if the lobster over 30 pounds is like has got to be. I mean, three times five is like 50. It's like it's almost 200 years old. What? Yeah, just about. I mean, said five years per. Yeah, 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 give or take. So, um, uh, now, yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know. That's one of the things is like there are, there are old ones that are like that. You know, they have pretty old lobsters in captivity. Another really old lobster in captivity was in San Francisco, and the guy it got actually someone grabbed it out of the tank, and while they were like running in their car, he dropped it, which is really sad. Oh. I know, I dropped it. Drops lobster. Is that a question? Since you you mentioned cr uh, crawdads a couple Dad. times. Um, Three questions about crawdads. Do they have negligis, negligible senescence uh, thing? No. How closely related to the lobsters are they? And why are they like, you know, poor people like, ew, gross food, and they're so delicious. I know, I know. Lobsters are like the, you know, luxury food. Like, how did that happen? Do you have any? I mean, that's kind of like the, that's, that's sort of like what we're talking about is what is the nature of, like, why do some things become luxury items and other things do not, you know? Like, well, I mean, why does it, who knows? Like, cr cr crawdads are smaller. I mean, yeah, there's less practically, on a, like, on a practical level, it takes a lot more work for a lot less meat yeah. <coughs> True. to get, like, it's meat out of the crayfish. Yeah. They grow in, like, little creeks and stuff. Yeah, to totally. And then you have, like, a huge boat, a big operation. Yeah, you know, 
Yeah, I think it's just re I think it's like regionalism and I just Which is why they should be with more. What's that? Which is why they should be with more. Because it's harder to get, it, you know what I mean? It's just like this less Yes. And they're probably available thing. They're probably more expensive in certain areas, but they're not as readily available. I think it yeah. has to do with yeah, maybe just like because it became associated with a class of people who be or mm -hmm. a group of people who are the butt of jokes and become like, you know, made fun of as like hicks or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? As opposed yeah. to like moneyed interests that had these big votes that could like make it be like, oh, this is the thing that's really delicious and amazing. Mm -hmm. but it's the same fucking thing. It's like a weird little sea book. Yeah. yeah, I mean lobsters have like this tail. They have this like white meat, they just like delicious white meat. You know, this whole tail, you know, <laughs> and this <laughs> claws. <laughs> They're so good. <laughs> yeah, but it's still good. It's just a lot. I think it's a lot more too. meat. You get a lot yeah. more for the work that you put into it. Yeah. Connor. Uh, this is a dick move on my part, but I wanted to respond to Nick. Uh, lobsters have a beautiful, delicate flavor, and crayfish <laughs> have a crass flavor, like getting punched in the gut. I mean, it could. Yeah, it could. It could be. That could be flavor. They do, just just, they do have a delicious, just sweet me. flavor. Just me. Yeah, we're, you're from Los Angeles. You're from Los Angeles. I'm from Los Angeles. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, yeah, it, well, it occurs to me that perhaps the uh, 17th century paintings, uh, those might have been taxidermy lobsters and the exoticism of having them shipped a couple months across the ocean might have been why they were an exciting thing to put in a pig portrait game. That is not something I ever considered, but it's, it's worth chewing on. You have to think about the nature of the painting. Was that the patron of the painting who commissioned the painting? Think about yes, that. and I don't. Somebody with lots of money. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know a whole ton about like the intricacies of like Dutch still life patronage and like the politics of that, you know, sort of uh, sort of thing. So um, I think you know, and which is maybe it's just probably sort of like a gap in my research in the sense that like I'm sort of strictly looking at them like formally, you know, but you have like this idea of this form and the substance of forming each other and uh, the form is really pat, you know, the form is like the red lobster, but the actual substance of lobster hood is infinitely more complex and so probably the same thing for paintings, I don't know, yes. What's with the blue lobster? Are they blue lobster? Well, um, lobster coloring, lobster, the reason that lobsters are, okay, it's called a uh, cyanochitin, I think, or, cy or like crustaceocyanin. Um, essentially, uh, lobsters are every color. Like they, the reason their shells are murky, which is they're sort of like underwater camouflage. The reason they're murky is because they, their shells exhibit like all spectrum of like all the spectra. For the entire spectrum of color. And so differently colored lobsters, like the yellow ones, the blue ones, the ones that are like half this one, you know, there's strict it's strictly a genetic mutation which only shows one um, one expression of that gene. So uh, one of the reasons one of the things that happens is just that when you boil a lobster, the only pigment that remains is the red, because it's like the most durable, you know, uh, it's, the mo it's the least resistant to heat. Um, so yeah, so that is, and that is why they are red when you cook them, because they are like every color, but the red is just the one that lack, that can survive, so. Um, are you at all familiar with the presence of the lobster and Jack Smith's uh, film and photography and performance? No. Um, I'm sent more information, but Yeah, who's, oh yeah, if you guys have any lobster anything, I just am like lobster lady now. I'm also on Twitter, people are like, you are basically a lobster. That's the other thing that happened, which is that I got really interested in lobsters, and in, be, in being interested in lobsters, I sort of became one. Yeah. So um, he yeah. he makes um, his, his landlords and the, mm -hmm. the friends for whom he fall he fell out with turn into lobster yeah. characters in his um, and then the word crusty cr and crustacean. Mm -hmm. So uh, like Jonas Mikas became Uncle. Crust or Uncle Crustacean. That makes a lot of sense. Lobster. Yeah, these yeah, things. And so um, it's it's interesting. It's okay. got, it's very different from the Odalisque, but it, it 
it's well, as in his work has a I mean, that's, interesting nemesis thing going on in it. That's like sort of an interesting thing that I, you know, uh, that's about the lobsters is that they sort of became for me a tool to think about by which they just sort of became this weird intersection. It was like there was like all these different things I was looking into, and then like at this intersection of this Venn diagram, there was like the lobster, you know. So mm -hmm. I can sort of they're an interesting way to think and talk about a variety of different issues. But then like, when you bring up Wallace, like that, um, the idea of the opposite of the top of the enemy, that mm -hmm. goes closer to what he was doing with it. Yeah, like how, you know, how do we have our own shadow and our own, mm -hmm. you know, like Manny's model both is the representation of that what she was and that which she wasn't. It's like you you know, you, in, and like the idea of like this, which is like this bottom dwelling shit sucker, mm -hmm. and it's also this like magnificent representation of luxury, like the idea that something can contain its own opposite, I think is really, is really interesting, you know, um, and that's why I'm trying to force everybody to be interested in it, so, <laughs> <laughs> so oh, Dina. Did you paint that lobster white to be like the white lady from the no, it actually just came this way. <laughs> it's the, it's just like this thing. Are you supposed to paint? But it is sort of yeah, it is sort of weird. I mean, it is like the white, you know, the white the white body. So, yes. Um, I was just sort of wondering, since we are in Maryland, like crabs, how do they relate in the structure of the world to mm -hmm. monsters, and are there any similarities or differences, or should we be thinking about that since? Those are, are crustaceans. I guess they're crustaceans. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not very good at science. Well, they are. They definitely are crustaceans, and they're definitely arthropods. Um, I think, you know, if maybe if I was from Maryland, I would have ended up sort of being more, inter you know, interested in crabs as well. I mean, it is really fascinating. You know, a lot of the crabs that are in Maryland are from North Carolina. You know, but they're marketed from like if you get a can, if the can does not specifically say these crabs. This crab meat is from harvested in Maryland. Exactly, it's harvested in Maryland. You know, it's usually from North Carolina. Um, but what? A lot of them sound specific. Yeah. So you have, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, you have a sort of weird, um, kind of limiting regionalism where I mean, yeah, crabs are also fantastic mm -hmm. because they also have that like, idea of the double bind and. Uh, I think crabs, I haven't read anything about crabs, actually, crabs actually do die. Um, they finish being reproductive and then they die. Um, yeah, and they also can only walk from side to side, which makes them super weird, you know, but they are, there is a lot of like, there's a lot, there is a lot of, there's definitely a lot of conflation, like philosophically, there's a lot of conflation with like, crabs, and crayfish, and lobsters. So like philosophically, they can they're, 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 they can be philosophically interchangeable in that sense, you know. Um, but I think crabs are sort of similar to crayfish in that the amount of, like crabs are gonna be expensive no matter how many crabs there are because, you know, um, plucking them is like, you don't get a lot, you don't, you don't get a whole lot of meat for the amount of, of crab you know, that gets, that gets fished. And they also, you're not going to end up getting like a super giant crab. Well, you might, I don't know. I mean, I do. They'd never be as old as a lobster. They probably are not going to be as old as a lobster because they don't, they just, they don't, they don't have the same, like they don't have that weird enzyme thing. Um, do you guys want to hear about how lobsters have sex? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's critically low. Okay. So uh, the way that lobsters have sex is that, okay, so lobsters, um, they pee out of their face, and they have these two, they have these two glands, these two things right here uh, that eject, they, they urinate out of their face, and when they meet each other, they pee in each other's faces, and then that is how they determine whether or not they're going to fight, um, and so male lobsters will fight for like the best little rocky crag, they'll fight for the best little kind of apartment. Um, and um, you know, so when researchers are looking at lobsters, they'll they'll build apartments that like PVC pipes and stuff. And so, um, basically, each lobster has a, a unique genetic signature. So if two lobsters fight, 
um, and one wins, and if they meet again by some crazy, insane chance, hundreds of years later or whatever, um, if one lost or lost to another, it'll recognize it and it won't try and fight it again. Um, so, what happens is the male, let's say that there's like an alpha lobster and a beta lobster, and the alpha lobster has like the best place and he already fought and beat this other guy for it, and then he just hangs out. And the female lobster will come up to his doorway and she'll piss in his doorway. <laughs> and she'll basically be like, here's my scent, and then she'll, she'll basically just do that a couple times until he comes around. And Finally, eventually, he'll get the he'll get the picture, and he will uh, he'll kind of like let her in, and then they just sort of like like pee on each other these pheromones that are like sexy time pheromones, you know. And so uh, then they, they do this kind of really tender and sensitive thing, and they like stroke each other with their antenna, their like long antenna, um, and then finally he gets her so jacked up that she rips off her shell. She takes off.